Amen. Praise the Lord. I want to just uh, uh, again welcome all of you. I also want to let the kind of let the church know that hey, this uh, week, coming week, right? Um, it's the first time that we are having our first uh, board of mentors meeting. You know, in uh, in September when the Lord called us out to plan a new church. I remember uh, shortly after that, I was with Wendy at uh, Jewel, and we were having uh, lunch. And in my mind, I was thinking, Lord, we will, you know, with the new church, we need a, you know, management board, you know, and things like that, which is legally required. And as I was saying that, it was like as though the Lord, you know, just pushed those thoughts out of me and then planted a new set of thoughts in me. And the Lord said to me, uh, Lord, before you have a management board, I want to give you a board of mentors. And these men and women will mentor the church in four different areas. And, um, and of course, the Pastor Nikki's name came up first, and, you know, and the Lord said that he'll be one of them. And then there's Jerry and Sue, and they come from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, up in the States, and they're going to be arriving Tuesday, and they're going to be speaking next uh, weekend. And then, of course, there's uh, Peg Hong, uh, um, who's a Singaporean uh, lady, and who's been like a real spiritual mom to me for the last couple of years. And, and the Lord made it so clear that they, were, they weren't just here to watch over what's happening in the church, but they were supposed to bring elements that will, you know, like pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that will complete what God wants to do. They'll actually bring pieces of what God wants to do to us, you know. And uh, so next week, we're going to actually have all of them here together uh, in Singapore, and we're very, very excited. I just want to also mention that Jerry and Sue are coming next week, and on Thursday evening, we have just a single uh, evening meeting with them. And, you know, I've known uh, uh, Jerry and Sue for quite a number of years, and if there is a marriage that Wendy and I really, really admire in this world, it'll be their marriage. We totally love the way they do marriage. They demonstrate it. And uh, we look up to them. And also, you know, Jerry has changed my thinking about money more than any other person. You know, and, and so I, I really feel like it's going to be a great time. Now, if you um, want the Lord to use you through finances, through money, next Thursday evening, 7.30 here, come and join us. And we're going to do a one single night money talks, okay? And, um, and so come and join us. But this weekend, uh, today and tomorrow, of course, we're going to have Pastor Nikki uh, with us. And I've known uh, Pastor Nikki now 21 years. And he started preaching when he was 17. He came from a line of preachers and pastors. And he never, ever wanted to be a pastor. <laughs> and, um, and amazing that God would, uh, um, um, you know, call him out. You know, and how God, you know, ambushes us, you know, in what our own plans are and what God's plans are. And so in the last 21 years, uh, Pastor Nikki has been really um, a steadfast uh, pillar in Wendy and my life, in our children's life. And uh, my kids have flown on their own all the way up to the States, spent months with, uh, with Nikki as well. And he's, um, uh, I always tell people this, is my long lost brother, born of a different dad and different mom, okay? And um, yeah, we, somehow we should have been born brothers or something like that. But I really want to encourage us to open our hearts uh, this evening. And let's put our hands together. Let's welcome Pastor Nikki. Wow. Praise God. God is a good God. Amen. Amen. Whenever I am um, speaking... I like for people also to talk. So uh, would you look at your neighbor for a moment? It might require some faith. Uh, but just look at them eye to eye for a moment and say, neighbor, come on, look at your neighbor for a moment. Say, neighbor, life is better because I'm connected to you. It's so good to be here uh, this uh, evening, and I think, wow, in one year I can get to come back twice in so uh, short time. Uh, but uh, just so happy to be here and, and tonight just to bring God's Word to you. You know, many times when God's Word comes to us, um, it comes like bread in our life. You know, it's something that we are going through uh, right now that God speaks to us and we get challenged and we respond to God. Uh, many times God's Word comes like a seed to us that something is planted in our life and it might not connect to where it is right now, but God speaks something and prepares us as we move forward in the direction that God has for us. Amen? 
But many times God's word also comes in our life, like tonight, where you're going to have to look at your life and say, you know what, hey, what am I really doing with what God has given me? It's a time of really taking personal responsibility. It's a time of growth. Amen? And so tonight, hopefully, um, as I talk for the few moments, I've got a slide, and, and I've got a lot of things on the slide, and so you probably have to take pictures, or maybe I can copy the slide and give it to Pastor Elijah, and you can always um, look at it, because when it comes to church, when it comes to God, you know, people always want, like, the lowest level of things, responsibility, you know. Like, if they want to go to a college and do PhD, I mean, they'll write this long PhD, they'll stay up till 2 o'clock in the morning, drinking coffee, Church, just give me two points. And I hope that your attitude towards God and towards His Word is like, I don't want to live for minimum things. I want to get the maximum that God has for my life. Amen? And so tonight, hopefully, I just share just a few things with you tonight. And, and I'm titling my message something like this. It's very simple. One phrase that is, fulfill your ministry, you know, fulfill your ministry. And so I want to just kind of walk you th through it and walk you through some uh, things that I feel like uh, the Lord laid upon my heart as you are just in this season of growing and a season of, of uh, letting God form you as a church and, and as a people connect to one another and take responsibility in the direction that you are going. Amen. Whenever I open God's Word, I always tell people that as I study the Scriptures, I find that there are three encounters that we constantly need to have in our life. And maybe not, not on a daily basis, but hopefully it's on a daily basis, but, but, but consistently in our life. Number one is what I call a truth encounter. And what that simply means is that, that we have to be challenged in our belief system. Why do we believe what we believe, and does it line up to God's Word? Because the Bible says God's Word is truth, and is the truth that sets us free. Amen? And so we always need, the Bible says, the entrance of God's Word brings light. And so we always need to have what I call a, a truth encounter. What is the Word of God saying to me? Regarding my marriage, regarding my relationship, regarding my money, regarding my walk, what is God's word saying to me that I need to change and align to what God's intent and purpose is? Amen? Number two, you need to have what I call a power encounter. What that simply means is this, that you need to experience the Holy Spirit in a deep, personal intimate way, right? Just like we just sang this song just now as we ended. By the way, Eleven, you did a great job. Yeah. Wow, if you can do like that on a sore throat, then I need to come back for it. <laughs> <laughs> and our God is an awesome God, amen? And it's experienced the Holy Spirit power that God is able and willing and desires to do great things in my life, in your life. You need to experience the power of God in your life. Amen? And number three is what I call a personal encounter. And what that means is throughout the Bible is people had personal encounters with God. And a personal encounter simple, simply means this. It's an encounter of your identity. To realize who you are and can you see yourself the way that God sees you as. It's like Gideon. When God called him, he said, listen, I'm the least. And God said, listen, you are a mighty man of valor. It's like Simon in the Bible. Listen, I, I, I'm Simon. I, I'm like shaken like a reed. He said, no, you are Petros, a solid rock, right? In the same way, every one of us, there needs to be a constantly, we need to recognize and learn to see ourselves the way God sees us as, especially in times when nothing good is happening, especially in times when it's a season in our life that's a dark season, especially in times when we feel like there is barrenness and we are not really growing and nothing good is really happening. We need to learn to see ourselves the way that God sees us as. Amen? And so tonight, 
what I want to do is I want to just take a look at a scripture verse that is there and then kind of just walk you through it step by step. One of my favorite verses is in the book of Ephesians. It's Ephesians chapter number 5, verses 15 through 17. I've got about 13 or so Bible verses which are like my verses. You know, these are verses that every single day I pray out. And one of them is these verses that is there, you know. And so would you read with me? Okay. Okay. And so tonight, this is not a competition who can finish first, but let's read together, okay? And don't read it like, like open your mouth. You're not reading a false document, okay? You're reading the alive written word of God, amen? And so let's read it out loud. Three, two, one. Look carefully then how you walk. Live purposefully and worthily and accurately. Not as the unwise and witless, but as wise, sensible, intelligent. Therefore, do not be vague and thoughtless and foolish, but understanding and firmly grasping what the will of the Lord is. Amen. I like this verse because especially I love the Amplified Bible. Uh, it, it says something like, it says, listen, be careful how you walk. Okay? Take a look at your life. How are you walking? Are you walking in a sense that you're living life with purpose? You're living life with a sense of accuracy to God's will and his blueprint for you. That you're living life worthy. I mean, would you use these words to describe your life? Like, like, hey, how is your life? Listen, I'm living life accurately to what God has for me. Like, I am living life full of purpose. I like this verse. Why? Because if God tells us something, then he gives us the full potential for us to really walk it out in our life. Amen? As Pastor Lip said, I grew up in a church family. Uh, 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 sorry, a family of pastors. In my personal family now, we are over 41 pastors. We don't know how to do anything else. <laughs> and and, and, and we, we're like the tribe of Levi, you know, like everybody's like, yeah, I'll become a pastor. Uh, and it's not because we want to become a pastor, but of course, because the call of God in our life. But, but we grew up in church and, uh, you know, we, we grew up among, in all kinds of church setting and things like that. But we always had a, a hunger and always had a, a, a desire for the word of God. And one of the things I thank God for my mom and dad. Why? Because they created an environment for us not only to, uh, to, to just learn the word of God, but to hear the voice of God, you know. And so as long as I can remember when I was 14, 15, 16, yes, I didn't want to be a pastor, but, but, but there was a hunger, there was a desire inside of me that, that I want to be that person that God thinks that I am. That the plans of God, the purposes of God... That's what I want to become. And so when I look at these verses, I think, you know what? Hey, it is possible. I can live life worthily. I can live life accurately. Amen? And so having that foundation, I want to take a look at a verse in the Bible and, and give you a verse tonight. Uh, uh, hopefully that verse would speak to you. Hopefully that one verse would take it for the rest of the year, that you would take it seriously. And it's a verse found in the book of Timothy. Now, this is like a father talking to his son in the ministry. This is a mentor talking to his, uh, in a sense, the person is mentoring. And he, he, he is Paul saying to Timothy, it's one of his last letters that he's writing. Uh, Timothy, of course, at that time is hearing from Paul in a, in, a, in a season where the political climate at that time was not good. The church climate at that time was not good. Paul was not in a good place in the sense he was in prison, but he wrote to him something that was foundational. And in the midst of all of that, he says something like this in 2 Timothy chapter number 4, verse 5. And this verse becomes what they call the key to the book of Timothy. That means the whole of the book of Timothy is about this one verse. Okay. That means in this verse, if you memorize this verse, you would know the whole book of Timothy. Because the whole book of Timothy is only talking about this one verse. Okay? And so it says something like this. Would you read with me tonight? Okay, Let's read together. Three, two, one. But you, Timothy, be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. And fulfill your ministry. 
Amen? Fulfill your ministry. Like another translation says, but you be sober in all things. Right? Be sober. I like another translation. It says, but in, <laughs> keep your head in all situations. Right? So, and so there are simply four things that I want to say to you from this verse. And, and hopefully something that you take seriously for the rest of the year as like a, a verse I'm giving to you uh, tonight. You know? It's four things that are there. You know? And so it's four things that I'm going to speak about tonight. Number one, be sober and watch. Number two, be steadfast and war. Number three, be sharing and witness. And number four, be stable and work. Okay? So those are the four simple things that I want to talk about tonight. Okay? Regarding you, regarding me. Okay? The first thing tonight, okay, the first thing, be sober and watchful. Okay? Now here's what the Bible says, says but you be watchful. In all things. Now, in the Old Testament, the Bible days, and even today, in many of the nations, they're familiar with the word called watch or, or, or a watchman. Most houses would have like a watchman. Most cities would have watchmen. And the responsibility of a watchman is this, that they are aware. They're always on the lookout if there are any enemies and, and what they're doing. They're always on the lookout of what's happening in the city. Okay. They're always on the lookout to guard that which they have. For example, people have watchmen to guard their houses and their properties. In the same way, when the Bible says, listen, be watchful in all things, you got to realize this. Number one, are you aware of what the enemy is doing? <laughs> Number two, are you aware of what God is doing? People sometimes, they're only aware of what the news tells them. But, but, but are you hearing God? Are you aware of what God is wanting to do in this season in your life? In this season in the nation of Singapore? In this season in the world? Are you aware what God is wanting to do? Right. And tonight, more importantly, I want to bring it home to you and me. <laughs> it's like, are you aware of what's going on with you? Because sometimes we get so busy. Like, I, I say something like this. Sometimes we are so busy doing the work of the Lord that we forget the Lord of the work. Sometimes we are so busy. And please understand, I've been preaching for the last over 27 plus years. And there were times in my life that I went through seasons, you know, where I'm just, it's just motion, right? I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this. There are times in my life I also felt like that, that God, in spite of my immaturity, in spite of my own personal ambition, he was still good. <laughs> he was still considered. He still did things in my life, but internally I was dying. Internally there were things that were going the wrong way in my life. Internally, yes, I was in church. Yes, I was preaching. Yes, I was doing all those things. And by the time I was 23, 24 years old, I became very depressed. Why? Because ministry and working and serving God was a thing to do. It's like a checklist. I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. What's next? And, and God always does exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think, right? And so I, my ambitions were here, here, but God did it here. And so I came to a point that I became almost for two years very depressed. And I wasn't aware going through the motions of church life, walking with God, doing, even prayer is like, I'm just praying, but, but, but no, <laughs> no reality of in intimacy with God. I'm doing all the things, but no life in it. And I was unaware of my own self. In a Paul, when he called his first pastor's meeting in Acts 20, the first thing he said is, listen, take heed to yourself. It's like sitting in the plane. You know, when you go sit in the plane and the announcement is made, he say, listen, in, when emergency takes place and that thing falls from the top, right? First, take care of yourself. And it goes on to say even, even if you have a child, even if you have a baby, don't help that child. First, take care of yourself so that you can help. 
Am I making sense here? Yeah. And so Paul says to them, hey, listen, take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. Why? Because people will come and influence you the wrong way. People will come and you'll get caught up with ideologies and caught up with things that you don't want to, and you don't know. Suddenly, slowly and subtly, you started in the right place, but you ended up away from what your plan was, or in a sense, God's plan for your life. And in 27 years of ministry, one of the things that is shocking to me, that today when I started 27 years ago, more than 85, 90% of the people who started with me, they're no longer with God, first of all, <laughs> no longer in church. The people that I knew in church, 80, 90% are not there anymore. When I say not there, I simply mean this, they're not even walking with God. And these are the people, some of them I thought, wow, you want to know what, what someone who loves Jesus? Hey, look at this person. I mean, someone who's passionate, look at this person. I mean, these are the people I looked up to. What happened? They knew so much. They did so much. They didn't take heed to themselves. And so when I was 23, 24, 25, I put up something on the screen. And th 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 these are what I call dials that, you know, when you sit in a car, and, and in front of you, there's a dashboard, and on the dashboard, there are dials that tell you that, hey, you got so much fuel in the car, and, and the engine is so much hot, and, 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 and you got this, this, and it, it tells you. Some dials you look at once in a while. Some dials you better have your eye on constantly. In the same way, I begin to realize that I need to take heed to myself. I'm going to put something on the screen. Hopefully, we, we, we will help you. I, at that 24, to 25, 26 years old, I decided to create some dials. And so now what I do is every four to six months, I stop my life. Why? So that I can take heed to myself. <laughs> so that I can look at some things in my life and say, Nikki, where are you at? You know, if you've been to any mall and as soon as you walk in the doors, the first thing that they have is a directory. And the directory, there is a map, and it tells you where all the stores are located. You're like, if you go here, 102, 103, 104, 203, 204, it tells you everything. But the biggest thing on that directory is a big red dot that says, you are here. Because it doesn't matter what's happening all day, it doesn't matter where what is. If you don't know where you are, you can't chart the course to get to where you need to be. Am I making sense to you? And so... This kind of helped me. And what are those things? Number one, family. Like, where are they? What is God doing in their life? And what is my responsibility with them? Why? You could, listen, at your workplace, they could give you awards and you'll be the shining star. And listen, you might be in the church and everybody thinks that you are somebody, but at home they think you're nobody. You're winning the world, but losing your family. What's the point? And so you've got to know, where is your family at? How can, can you see the future? Can you see 2028? Can you see 2032? I can't even see next Monday. <laughs> but the Bible says, Isaiah 46, 10, I'm the God who lets you know the end from the beginning. And so you have to have the ability to see the future. Where is God taking me? How about finances? How about failures? Like, like, what is not working and why? How about friends? Who are my friends and, and who do I need to let go of, more importantly? Why? Because you will never grow beyond the circle of the people around you. And so you need to ask yourself, God, who are the people that I need to welcome in my life? And who are the people I need to let go of? What are you doing now, Nikki, that, that requires faith? Listen, if the greatness of your life is in the past, something is wrong. Yes, the past was great, but listen, I'm looking to a future that is greater. Why? Because the Bible says you'll go from faith to faith, glory to glory. Amen? And so what am I doing now that requires faith? It's asking myself every four to six months, I stop my life and I say, hey, who are my fathers, plural? Who are the people that are speaking into my life? Why? Because listen, I need help. I need people in my life, in different areas of my life, who will cause me to grow, who will guard me, who will protect me, who will correct me. 
And so if you want to do something good, you do it by yourself. But you want to do something great, you got to have people in your life. How about your fitness? Where are you physically? Because the Bible says spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Fulfilled, are you happy? The Bible says, serve the Lord. How? With joy. Are you happy serving? Are you fulfilled, right? How about the fear of the Lord? Where is the fear of the Lord? Are you growing in it? Is this something for you to look at? The second thing Paul says to Timothy is, be steadfast and war. Right? He says something like this. He says, listen, endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ. Endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ. Now I'm not going to talk about spiritual warfare. Why? Because I know you can get all those kind of teachings and, and, and you can read yourself. But this is what I do want to say. That whenever you look at the armor of God in, in Ephesians chapter number 6, we find that, that it protects your heart, it protects your head, protects your hand, leg, Everything, but it doesn't protect your back. The back is completely open. And here's what you need in spiritual warfare. You need people who got your back. And therefore what God does, he takes us and puts us in a community called the local church. Right? And so please understand, going to church is not a tradition. Going to church is us coming together and getting each other's back, protecting one another. And so if you've been part of Life Church, or maybe your first time coming here this morning and, and uh, this evening, and you feel like, hey, this is, I like this. You've been coming here for a few, uh, few Saturdays. I like this. And, and I feel like this is where God wants me to be planted, or this is where I am planted. Then you got to ask yourself this question. As you're part of a local body, you have to ask, hey, how am I helping Bill? The vision that God has given. I don't want to be just a seat warmer. I don't want to be an attender. It's like, how am I having bill? Number two, how am I adding? Number three, how am I helping solve problems? Not creating, okay? How am I supplying? How am I supplying? And so my question always is, people say, well, 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 I'm a Christian. My question to them is, how are you serving? Because there is no such thing as a non-serving Christian. It doesn't exist. And then so you've got to find out what is it that God has put in your life. I'm not talking about doing responsibly. I'm talking about what is it that God has put in your life. Am I making sense to you? The third thing I want to say to you is be sharing and witness. He says, Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, but you, you be different. Don't blend in the crowd. But you, you are called to a different standard. You do the work. Don't be an evangelist, but do the work of an evangelist. The third thing I want to say to you is this, that be sharing and witness. A few years ago, I met a person and he asked me a question and it irritated me. You want people around you who will irritate you. And he was a pastor and, and I just happened to meet him at a meeting. And, and he, he, he said something to me which really irritated me. He, he asked me a question. He said, Nick, Nicky, he, he said, Nicky, um, do you have a list? Of people who you are praying for that don't know Je that don't know Jesus, I'm like, um, 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 uh, well, um, well, uh, I I pray. <laughs> oh, and it bothered me, and I'm like thinking. Why am I doing church? Why am I doing... Why am I, if people who don't know Jesus are not coming to know Jesus, what am I doing? 
And then he pressed me more and more, and he pressed me more and more. And, and at that time, this verse became a very lively verse to me. And I was reading through, and, and began to speak in my life that God takes people, puts them in families. He leads prisoners out of prison into productive lives. And I began to realize that God uses people to bring freedom to people. And I'm realizing that I don't know how to do this. I know how to preach and give altar call at the end of the message, but, but I don't know how to really bring Jesus to people. And then he challenged me. Why? Because the Bible says some verses like this, which became really heart-rending. He says, listen, the Bible says, can we read this verse together? I like the message Bible in this. Why? Because he just slaps you in your face. <laughs> Let's read it together, okay? Let's read it together. Three, two, one. My dear friends, if you know people who have won, don't write them out. Go after them. Get them back and you will have rescued precious lives from destruction and prevented an epidemic of wandering away. Wow, this is bigger than the pandemic. He's like, listen, go after them. And I began to realize I'm not going after anybody. I'm waiting for them to come to me. Go after them. Like, go after them. The person who said this to me, they're two brothers, and they wrote a book about their church. And it's a great book for every person. If you want a good book to read in this season of your life, you can get it on Kindle and buy it. They're two brothers who started a church in, in, in Chicago, and now the church is over 25 some thousand people. And they started with one-on-one, -on -one and, and the book is called Bless. And so I began to take that, teach it in my church, put it in my own life as practice. And basically, the idea is something like this. It says, learn to bless people. Number one, what B means to begin with prayer. That means make a list of people who don't know Jesus and start praying for them. This is a good assignment for you tonight. <laughs> Why? Because where you live, there's a lot of people. Where you work, there's a lot of people. <laughs> right? who don't know Jesus, you can at least start by praying for them by name. Am I making sense to you? Praying for them by name, right? And so, uh, listen, you got to make a plan, right? Who do we need to pray for? Am I making sense to you? And I began to realize most people don't even know how to pray for the lost, like, if I took the mic and went around people who, who were maybe saved uh, Christians for 20 years, and I asked them, hey, how should we pray for those people who don't know Jesus? They don't even know how to pray. Can I tell you something? I did not know how to pray, yet I was preaching, writing books, going around here and there. I had no clue. My whole prayer was, God, uh, get them saved. <laughs> Hope they come to know Jesus, do something in their life that they'll open up. And I did not. And so I had to learn. And I want to say to you today that, listen, get a list of people. <laughs> Start praying. Learn how to pray for people who don't know Jesus. There are people who got theological degrees, but not one person they've led to Jesus Christ. But they can argue. They can argue what's right, what's wrong. But, 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 but they can't allow love to flow through their life, to touch others. Number two, listen to people. Right? Listen to people. Listen to people. Right? Jesus, in the New Testament, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, there were 183 questions asked. Jesus asked the question and he just listened to people. Don't give your comment, just listen to people. <laughs> right? Why? Because he will tell you a lot about what their needs are. Am I making sense to you? What their needs are. Eat with people. Like you have 21 opportunities every week to eat with people. <laughs> Don't eat with the same people, it's boring. <laughs> like at least the tithe of that, like maybe three people every week, make a decision. Listen, I've never been in any country, I've never been in any country yet, that somebody turned down food. <laughs> you have your colleagues at work, you have neighbors, just say to them, hey, let me buy you breakfast. 
instead of sending missions money somewhere, it's all around you. Just say, hey, can I buy you lunch? Can I buy you dinner? And just go sit down and just listen to them. Something happens when you eat with people. They open up their lives. You got 21 opportunities every week to do that. And no point of just meeting with another person who already knows Jesus. Hello, somebody. You want to sow something in somebody's life? Buy them breakfast. Buy them lunch. Buy them dinner. And just be there. Hey, can I? Why are you doing this? No reason. Just want to love you. Bless you. People think you've gone crazy. Just tell them yes. (laughs) Eat with people. Listen, serve people. Ask people, hey, is there something I can do for you? Is there something? Is there something I can do for you? Find a way that you can serve people. Find a way. Why? There are so many times people don't know who their neighbor is. They don't know. They've been living on that block. They've been living in that house. They might know their names. They they don't know. 20 years, they're their neighbors. But do you know how they are relational? Do you know how they are emotional? Do you know how they are mentally? Why? Why why should I care? Because when you are not a Christian, a person who has not been born again is very selfish. Only cares about themselves. But a person who's become a Christian, selfishness has died, and you think about others. Am I making sense? You you think about others. So I want to just encourage you, learn to kind of bless people, and then find a way when that opportunity comes to tell your story of how you encountered God. Am I making sense to you? What would, what would the rest of the year look like if everyone here, right? We just, if every person here, we just took a simple thing and just started praying, just started making a list. Like, who do we know at our workplace, uh, around us, in our neighborhood, like who that doesn't know Jesus? And you might not know anything except their name. You might not even know the name. Go ask the name. Like, hey, you're my neighbor solo. I don't even know your name. What's your... Just write it down and just start praying for them. I wonder what Life Church would look like by December, by, by January 1st. Right? And, and please, let me say this nicely. Don't make it a habit of bringing people to church. I know that sounds like bad. Why? Because you're not called to bring people to church. You're called them to bring them to Jesus. You bring them to Jesus first and then bring them to church. Don't let somebody else do your job. Because sometimes people say, I just brought him to church, let the pastor do it. (laughs) No, you do it. Am I making sense? Yeah. Let me just say one more thing and I'll kind of close with this and our time is up. Is is be stable and work. The fourth part is this, that, that Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, fulfill your ministry. What does that mean? What does that mean? That means... I think it was years ago, uh, I think it's 1996 Olympics, I think it was um, one of those people who, you know, they have those 100 meter dashes, you know, uh, and, and the person who actually won the race was disqualified. Why? Because while they were running, they stepped outside of their lane. When the Bible talks about fulfilling your ministry, all it is saying is this, stay in your lane. What is it that God has called you? What are the gifts that God has given you? What are the resources that I've given in your hand? He said, stay in your lane. Because what happens is this, as we go through life, you'll start meeting people, you'll start having opportunities open up, you say, oh, I can do this, and I can do that, and I can do this, and I can do that, and I can, I can. And you'll start doing 101 things which God has not called you to do. Hello, somebody. And I want to say to you, stay in your lane. (laughs) Stay in your lane. Why? Because stuff will happen. Why? Because stupid stuff will happen. Why? Because life will happen. And and things will go crazy. Like, you say, well, well, (laughs) I go to Life Church. (laughs) It's the greatest church on the face of this earth. 
stay here for a while. Then tell me after two months. <laughs> Why? Because every time you get a group of people, in the beginning, they all like each other. <laughs> all like them. After some time, oh, they can fight about the stupidest stuff. <laughs> Not you people, you people are very nice. I'm talking about my church. <laughs> And, 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 and we start getting in other people's business and this and that and why, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Listen, the Bible says something like this, that you and me are built up like a house, right, with living stones, right? I like that. You know why? I'm glad it doesn't say brick because bricks are boring because bricks are the same shape and size, right? Six inches, six inches, six inches, six inches, six inches. Stone, I mean real, not those fake ones. The, the real stone, to build a wall is very tough. Because no stone is the same shape and size. And it takes a lot of work to chisel, make them fit together. And so a church, in the first few, it's very nice. But when st God starts putting people together, it's very painful. There's a lot of noises. There's a lot of differences, a lot of this and that. And, and God has to fit them together. And please understand, when you become part of a church, you're being fitted together. And it's not, praise the Lord, hallelujah, it is painful. Because yeah. people surprise. Why? People have differences. I never did like this, and I never did like and I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. And, and you've got to come to a place that, hey, stay in your lane. What is it that God has called me? What is it that God has gifted me for? What is, and then how am I supplying the, how am I, fulfill the ministry, stay in your lane. Like, stay in your lane. Why? Just because somebody's doing this, somebody, stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. Am I making sense to you? And so tonight as I close, here's what I want to say to you. Paul saying to Timothy, very simple. He says, be watchful in all things. Like, be on alert. Don't let your guards down. Be aware of what the enemy is doing. Be aware of what God is doing especially. Don't be so impressed by the enemy. Right. But be impressed with what God is doing. And take heed to yourself. Number two, I want to say to you, listen, endure hardship. As a good soldier of Christ, and one of the ways to win spiritual warfare is get people on your side. Be part of a community where you're able to not just come and warm the seat at church, but you have to have relationals that you're building in the house of God. People who will back you, or people who will guard you, people who will protect you. You can be transformed. But I say to you tonight, listen, do the work of an evangelist. And I say to you, stay in your lane. You're going to a greater place. Amen? Amen? Would you just stand with me for a moment? You know, what God has for you is miraculous and it's life-changing. But whatever God has requires something from us. It requires us to reach out in faith and grab hold of it and go that direction. And so tonight, as I just close in prayer, it's up to you to take whatever I've shared and to take whatever it is that you earn and to find where are you at with it. And by your response, you either lock on to it or you let go of it. And so tonight, as I pray, I just want you to not to respond to me, but just to respond to God tonight. Ask him for help. Ask him for direction. Father, I did my job tonight of what you put in my heart for Life Church and this time together. And, and I pray in the simpleness of your word, that Holy Spirit, that you'd stir up hearts, that you'd open up, that you'd unlock, that you'd unpack that, you, that which you want to do in every person, through them and for them. And by the power of your spirit, that you cause realignment, courage, and strength to move forward in the direction that you have. I bless you tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Praise the Lord. Just uh, remain where you are, and uh, we're just gonna just pause for a moment. Amen. You know, sometimes you know we are very quick to move from one part to the next part, and you know, sometimes in our uh, we are so conditioned to you know with, with a, a time schedule to say, hey, we're gonna end this time. This is you know, and. Um, but at the same time, I, I think that we sometimes just need to put some margin in our lives where we just put an extra bit of time where we can just pause and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Amen. And I, 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 f- I just feel this evening that as Pastor Nikki was speaking, I really felt like there was a liberty upon him to, to speak and, you know, I've known him for 20 over years. We have preached all over the world together. You know, and, and there's some places that we've been to, literally the signs and wonders we've seen are just extraordinary. And there's some places where, you know, there's, there's the Word of God that is declared. And there's some places we go to and we struggle, you know. But this evening, I really felt like there was a liberty for him to just speak something. There is a liberty of the Spirit of God that is present for him just to say something. And I know that, you know, there's something that he's spoken that is here for us, every one of us. We can just pause for a moment. Man has done their work. And all we need to do is make room for God to do His work, amen, in us. If you just pause for a moment, would you, just for a few minutes. I'm going to, you know, I, I'm going to go totally silent. Just for a few minutes, if you just ask the Lord, He says, Lord, will you just speak to me? Will you just show me what you will say to me tonight? Father, we just come to you, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, that your hand is not too short, that you are not able to reach us. Your ears, Lord, are able to hear our cries, Lord. Your eyes see all that we go through. And you have mouth, Lord, to speak to us as only we can fully comprehend, Lord. And Father, I thank you, O God, that you have spoken into our hearts. I thank you, O God, that you have steered our orientation towards you. And at the preaching of your word that is declared, Lord, that there will be a settling of this word, Lord, into our spirit, into our hearts. Father, that something will just keep recurring, Lord, in our minds and our thoughts, Lord, from what you have spoken to us tonight, Lord. Father, we didn't come for a religious service, Lord. We came for you. We came to hear your voice. 
Lord, we came, Lord, because that which we do and we gather like that in your name, Lord, there is a reality that comes down from heaven of your presence, of your reality, Lord, that is so real that we can hear you speak to us. Father, we pray according to your word, Lord, that as your word, your preached word goes forth, Lord, your spoken word, the word of God, Lord, goes forth, Lord. Let it not return to you void. Lord, let it change, let it transform us. Let it change the way we think, Lord. Let there be a consciousness of what you are doing and saying to us right now, Lord. Lord, we welcome you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you, Lord. Father, and we give you thanks. We bless you, Lord. We love you, Lord, with all our hearts, God. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. And Father, I just want to speak your blessings over my brothers and my sisters in this place, Lord. Your people, every one of us, purchase by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, Lord. The blessings of God the Father, the blessings of God the Son, and the blessings of God the Holy Spirit be with you, abide with you, now and forevermore. And everybody say, Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap, offering, shall we? Amen. Praise the Lord.